going to talk about air pollution for a little bit, but mainly we're going to talk about um, global climate change and we're going to specifically look at how human impacts uh, are causing the intense global warming that we're seeing today. Now I'm actually going to break this into two lectures. So the first half we're going to talk about air pollution, we're going to talk about natural causes of climate change, and then we're going to talk about something called paleoclimatology. We'll break them and the second half we'll be talking about the greenhouse effect, greenhouse gases, and some of the impacts that we're seeing uh, simply because it's, it's a fairly long topic. Now before we get started I also want to warn you guys uh, I tend to get agitated when talking about climate change and so if I raise my voice and I will raise my voice I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the ignorance that is out there, especially from one political party, I won't say who, Republicans, who deny that, that global warming is real. And so I tend to get a little bit uh, frustrated. And, and so I just want you to know I'm not mad at you guys. I'm simply, uh, this is one of the, the subjects that kind of gets me riled up. And so let's begin and let's first define what air pollution is. Air pollution is the introduction of any compound into the atmosphere at high enough levels to do two things. Either harm living organisms, not just humans, any living organism, or to damage the environment. I know that's a fairly broad definition, but that's what we're going to call it. So anything that can damage the environment or damage biological organisms that's air pollution. Now there's two main types of air pollutants. There are what are called primary pollutants and secondary pollutants. A primary pollutant is anything that is directly emitted into the atmosphere. Now I know when we hear the word pollutants we generally think of man-made or synthetic. Well believe it or not guys, primary pollutants can be natural let's say the soot from a wildfire or the ash from a volcanic eruption those would be classified as primary pollutants or it can be synthetic man-made like when we burn uh, fossil fuels when we burn coal for electricity and we produce gases like CO2 that would be the anthropogenic or the artificial primary pollutants now once those primary pollutants get into the atmosphere they don't just stay there doing nothing they react with one another to produce additional substances called secondary pollutants. The best example of this I can give you is smog. Uh, photochemical smog is actually a combination of hundreds of gases. If you've, if you've ever been, um, if you've ever looked across the valley or if you've ever been in LA and you notice that kind of haze that hangs uh, on the horizon that's smog and it's not one gas it's actually hundreds of gas that makes it up but smog is a direct result of those primary pollutants reacting with one another in the atmosphere so a primary pollutant is something directly emitted into the atmosphere and if those substances if those compounds react with one another to produce new substances those new substances are secondary pollutants now here are examples of both. On the left hand side, that top picture is a volcano that erupted in Russia back in 1994. Now you can see the ash uh, cloud. That would be primary pollutant. What you don't see is all the SO2, the carbon monoxide, the hydrogen sulfide gases that are released. That, those would also be considered primary pollutants. Natural primary pollutants. The bottom picture there is a wildfire in California also same thing. You see the ash and the dust and the debris but what you don't see is the other gases, the carbon monoxide, the CO2, those would all be natural primary pollutants. The picture on the right hand side is smoke from a factory that would be considered artificial primary pollutants. So remember when we talk about primary pollutants, it's not just the artificial. We have both natural sources and artificial sources. 
believe it or not, guys, think about what you're doing right now. You're taking in O2, you're using stored sugars from food, and what are you giving off? CO2 gas. Each of you is a natural source of CO2 gas from cellular respiration. So all of you are natural sources of primary pollutants. Here's the secondary pollutants. This is Mexico City. I hope this isn't a good day. Um, but once again, you see that haze or smog, uh, and that's hundreds of different gases, all as a result of the chemical reactions that occur in the atmosphere from primary pollutants. Now, let's take a look at some of the major groups of air pollutants. And anything that is either in the solid or the liquid form, we're going to put under the umbrella called aerosols. Okay? Everything else we talk about in, is in gaseous form. So if you're talking about like small dust particles, ash, pollen, even small droplets of acid that form, all of those are collectively called aerosols. So anything in solid or liquid form are aerosols. Now everything else we're going to talk about are going to be in the gaseous form. Now we have our nitrogen oxides our NO, our NO2, and our NO3. Now, I think I've said this before, humans are naturally lazy guys. And so instead of writing out all those three gases, what we tend to write is NO with a subscript X. So instead of this three here, guys, if you ever see it, and you will see it on my PowerPoints, if you ever see NOX, that's all of the nitrogen oxides together. So it could be NO, NO2, or NO3. It's just a short term. And I'll point that out when we get to that. Um, once again, it's just a short term for our nitrogen oxides. We have our sulfur oxides, primarily sulfur dioxygen. We have our carbon oxides, carbon monoxide, CO, and carbon dioxide, CO2. We have our hydrocarbons. Remember, we talked about that in environmental health, guys. Whenever we burn fossil fuels, coal, oil, or natural gas, we tend to produce those substances that have carbon, hydrogen, and sometimes oxygen in their structure. Remember our BTEX compounds, guys. Benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylenes. All of those would be classified as hydrocarbons. We have our CFCs, which stand for chlorofluorocarbons. These are compounds, as the name implies, that has chlorine, fluorine, and carbon in their structure. CFCs were very commonly used prior to 1980 in things like hairsprays, refrigerants, um, even air conditioning systems. Uh, we discovered in the late 70s, if you guys remember that whole uh, over Antarctica, the hole in the ozone layer. That was caused by CFCs. They actually destroy a molecule in the atmosphere called ozone. And so there was something called the Montreal Protocol, which was this kind of international agreement in 1980 that the developed world, the post-industrial world, would stop using CFCs because of their damage to the ozone. Now, CFCs are still used in the pre-industrial world, guys but generally in the US, Canada, Australia, uh, CFCs have been banned. And then we have ammonia, NH3. Now think about, and remember in our introductory topic guys, we talked about um, natural resources, how all global economies depend on natural resources. And what did I say the US's economy was built on? Remember I said agricultural crops, um, wheat, corn, soybeans, uh, dairy products and so it should come as no surprise guys is that because of all that agricultural activities we actually have NH3 in the gaseous form especially in um, the atmospheric area above major agricultural producing states Iowa Missouri even California so very very common in the US because of our agriculture um, industry now I think I've used the term weather before. Um, we were talking about physical hazards, and I, and I said you, they could either be geologic 
or weather, and I didn't define it. Well, let's talk about what weather is now. Weather is what the atmosphere is doing over a small region over a short period of time. Now, weather can change from minute to minute, hour to hour, day to day, week to week. But here's the key thing. It's a short-term phenomenon. Okay. Um, right now, today's weather is it's sunny and hot. Okay. So, short-term phenomenon over a small area. Now, we are more concerned for this topic about what climate is. And climate is what the atmosphere is doing over a much larger area over a longer period of time. Here's the key, ladies and gentlemen. Climate is the average weather condition over years, decades, centuries, millions of years, billions of years. But generally, what when we talk about climate, guys, the very bare minimum of time is its years, over years. Okay? If we talk about a hot day, is that climate? No, that's weather. If we talk about a hot summer, is that climate? No, still weather. But if we talk about four hot summers in a row, is that climate? Yes, it is. Okay? So, think about, it's all about the time frame, guys. Weather, short-term phenomenon. Climate, long-term phenomenon. A cold day, a cold month, a cold year. That's all weather. A cold decade, a cold century, a cold millennium, that's climate. Are we good? Okay, very, very key. Now, whatever we're talking about, whether it's short-term or long-term, weather or climate include temperature is usually the big one. Everybody wants to know what the air temperature is. We can also talk about things, precipitation, humidity, how much moisture is in the air, um, cloud cover, winds, all of these are wrapped up in weather or climate. Now, here's the key thing. Our weather and climate isn't constant. It varies with both location and over time. If we were to compare the climate of Las Vegas, Nevada over the last 10 years with the climate of, say, Bangladesh over the same time frame, would they be the same? Of course not. Okay, so most of us know that there's a spatial component, a location component, and then climate is not constant. There have been periods in the past where it's been much warmer than it is today, and there have been periods in the past where it's been much colder than it is today. So let's take a look at the spatial component first. What this are, these are graphs, guys, of temperature, precipitation throughout the year, okay? So this red line here is temperature, and these bar graphs down here are how much precipitation we get. So let's go to our equatorial area, guys, right here. Notice it's hot and wet. If we go to our polar areas, what do we notice? It's cold and dry. We've talked about this, guys, when we talked about biomes. And so most of us logically know that there's a difference from place to place on the Earth as far as weather or climate goes. But we also have this temporal component, this time component. What this is, is the last 542 million years. That's down here on this axis, guys. Remember, that's the Phanerozoic Eon, where the cool stuff with life happened. Now, there have been periods of time where it's been relatively warm. And there have been periods of time where it's been fairly cold. The cold periods are often called glacial periods or ice ages and the warmer periods in between are what are called interglacials. So right now guys the last ice age ended about 10,000 years ago with the extinction of the large mammals, the woolly mammoths, the mastodons, the giant um, 
uh, ground sloths. And so over the last 10,000 years, we have been in an interglacial where temperatures have been increasing. Now, here's what I want you to think about this, guys. And I remember we talked about Earth cycles earlier. Well, I want you to think about the climate, the climate system as this incredibly complex system that has thousands upon thousands upon thousands of parts or components. Okay? Think of it as kind of like an intricate, intricate Swiss watch that has many, many, many moving parts. Okay? Now, here's the important thing here, guys. All of those parts, all of those components interact with one another to produce something that we call feedback loops. And we're going to talk about the two different types of feedback loops, a positive feedback loop and a negative feedback loop. Let's start with the positive. In a positive feedback loop, we have a change that reinforces or strengthens or accelerates the original system. Now I know that doesn't um, make sense guys, so let's do an example. Okay, Let's start right here. Here is our original system. We have an increase in Earth's near surface temperatures. So a positive feedback loop guys is going to work to strengthen or reinforce this original condition. Okay? You always have to measure it relative to what the original system was. Okay? So what does an increase in temperatures cause? Well, we would see warmer temperatures, guys. We're going to see more evaporation from the oceans, right? That makes sense. All with all of that evaporation, we're going to put more water vapor, more gaseous water into the atmosphere. Now, I know we haven't talked about greenhouse gases, guys. We will eventually. But water vapor is what we call a greenhouse gas. What it does is it traps infrared radiation within the atmosphere, not allowing it to escape, which creates something that we call a enhanced greenhouse effect. So we trap all of this excess energy. We don't allow it to escape into a space we re-radiate it back down to the Earth's surface, which causes an increase in temperatures that we'll talk about called global warming. So let's go back through this, guys. So an uh, increase in temperatures, we see more evaporation, we put more water vapor into the atmosphere, which is a strong greenhouse gas. We then cause this strengthening of the greenhouse effect, where we trap all of this excess energy and what does that do? That is then going to further increase Earth's near surface temperatures. So this entire loop, guys, we started with an increase in temperatures. Where did we end up with? Even increasing temperatures even more. That's a positive feedback loop. On the other hand, we have negative feedback loops. These are interactions in which we work in opposition. We weaken the original system. So once again, I know that doesn't make sense, so let's do an example, guys. I'm going to take the same original condition, an increase in Earth's temperatures. So once again, we've already talked about how that's going to create more evaporation from the oceans. Now think about guys, all that water vapor as it gets up into the atmosphere, some of it's going to condense to create clouds. More water vapor in the atmosphere means more cloud cover. Well, think about guys, remember when we talked about albedo, the reflectivity of materials. When sunlight comes down and hits those light clouds, those white clouds, what, are, what does that energy do? Bounces back. It reflects back. And so, by, with more cloud cover, guys, we increase the Earth's albedo. Now, that solar energy, it hits the clouds and bounces off. It never reaches the Earth's surface. So, what is that going to cause? A decrease in Earth's near-surface temperatures. 
So we started with an increase and we ended up 180 degrees, exactly opposite of where we started. That's a negative feedback loop. So if you work to strengthen or speed up the original system is a positive feedback loop. If you work to weaken or slow down the original system or work in opposition of the original system, it's a negative feedback loop. Now, let's add them both together, guys, and what do we get? We get the resultant climatic system, which is both a combination of positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops. And so you've got to think of climate, guys, as this incredibly complex beast. Some of those interactions are working to strengthen the original system. Some are working in opposition of the original system. This is why we have known about climate change for decades. Since the, I would argue, the late 60s, we've known that the Earth has been getting warmer because of our actions. Why haven't we done anything about it? Well, first off, climate change solutions cost money. But second of all, guys, in order to fix climate change, we have to fix the entire system. You can't fix one component or one part. You got to fix the entire thing. Very, very complex and convoluted to do that, guys. Now, this is just some of the things that affect climate. Let's take a look at some of these guys. So cloud cover, uh, changes in the hydrologic cycle. We talked about that earlier in the semester. Volcanic activity, changes in atmospheric composition, circulation, winds would affect climate or weather. Um, how, once again, composition, changes in solar impact, inputs, the sun's output is not constant. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about natural causes of climate change here coming up. Um, the amount of sea ice, um, changes in oceanic circulation, changes in uh, ocean chemistry, in sea level, all change climate. But here's the big one, guys. Human influences. We are going to see later on in the second part of this discussion our we have a great impact unfortunately on climate now let's change gears a little bit guys and before we get to man's input before we get to the artificial climate change let's talk about natural causes of climate change okay so these are anything that we have no input guys natural processes that affect climate. And I want to talk about the five big ones. The first one are the Milankovitch cycles, and we'll talk more about these in detail in a minute, but these are variations in Earth's orbital characteristics, the tilt of Earth on its axis, the shape of Earth's orbit around the Sun, and Earth's rotational velocity on its axis, are the Milankovitch cycles, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in more detail here in a minute. Plate tectonics, something we've already discussed in this class, guys. Remember, remember we looked at Pangaea and how the continental land masses have been drifting apart over the last 220 million years. Well, think about what that affects, guys. We talked about this. As the, the continental land masses move, what does that change? Atmospheric circulation? and oceanic circulation, the two major mechanisms of heat transport across the globe. Plate tectonics also can trigger volcanism. Remember I mentioned a couple times in the past. Remember the um, Permian mass extinction event, guys? We think was triggered by plate tectonics, which then triggered volcanism, which then triggered global warming, very intense period of global warming. Oceanic circulation. We're going to talk about something called um, El Nino and La Nina. These are um, oscillations within the Pacific Ocean, and we'll talk about each one and how it would affect climate. Uh, we'll talk about our methane hydrates. We'll discuss what those are and how they affect it. And then we're going to talk about variations in output by the sun. 
about 11.2 years, ladies and gentlemen, the sun surface develops what are called sunspots. And we're going to see during that time period that the amount of radiation given off by the sun actually increases. And I'll uh, describe the mechanism here in a little bit. But let's start with the Milankovitch cycles, guys. There are three of them. Eccentricity, obliquity, and precession. Now let's start with eccentricity. This is changes in the Earth's shape, Earth's orbital shape around the sun. Believe it or not, guys, our path around the sun is not constant. There are times when that orbital shape is more spherical. So we're kind of equidistant all the way around the sun. There are other times where it's more elliptical, where Earth actually will move a little bit farther away from the sun. And during those times, we're, if we're farther from the sun, obviously that's going to affect the amount of radiation reaching us. Now this varies every 100,000 years or so. So is this going to cause short-term change? No. Okay, the changes we've been seeing over decades, well, that's not caused by Milankovitch cycles. These are long-term scales. Obliquity. This is the tilt of the Earth on its axis. What this does is it affects the severity of the seasons. If you change that angle, guys, and by the way, that angle ranges from about 22 to about 24 and a half degrees. As of right now, the last time I checked, I think we're at about 23 and a half degrees from vertical. So the Earth is not vertical up and down, guys. It's tilted on its axis. Right now, that angle's about 23 and a half degrees. But if you change that even a little bit, we would see that um, summers could be more severe, winters could be more severe, because the amount of solar radiation, remember insulation, would change as obliquity changes. Now obliquity varies every 40,000 years or so. So once again, this is not going to cause short-term variability. And finally, precession. This is the tendency of the Earth's axis to wobble in space. I want you to think of the Earth as a spinning disk, or if you've ever seen a dreidel, guys, okay? Earth's rotational velocity changes. So think of a spinning disk, guys. When the rotational velocity is high, the spin is going to be tight, right? So when the Earth's rotational velocity is high, Earth is going to have a tight spin to it. There's really not going to be any wobble to it. But when that rotational velocity slows down, and it does, the Earth develops a slight just a slight, it's not a big wobble, guys, but a slight wobble to it as it rotates on its axis. Now, what this affects is the timing of the seasons. If you develop a little wobble, the seasons may come earlier or later than normal. This varies every 23,000 years or so. So once again, guys, this is not going to cause short-term change. The Milankovitch cycles are long-term change. Now, let me show you what each of these looks like. So here's this top picture, guys, which, which is eccentricity. So when Earth has a more spherical shape around the sun, kind of equidistant, or more elliptical. Notice the, when it becomes elliptical, guys, we're going to be farther away from the sun, which is going to affect the amount of radiation reaching us. Uh, here's obliquity, the, the angle. Here's that angle we're talking about, guys. So that tilt varies from about 22 to about 24 and a half degrees. Currently, this angle is about 23 and a half. And then here's precession. Think of a spinning top, guys. The Earth is spinning on its axis. When we have a high rotational velocity, Earth will have a tight spin to it, no wobble. But when that rotational velocity slows down, we develop a slight wobble, which affects the timing of our seasons. Okay? Obliquity affects the severity of our seasons. Precession affects the timing. 
of our seasons. Um, here's plate tectonics. And I have pictures down here, guys. Remember, here's Pangea 200, 220 million years ago and what we see today, how the continental land masses have drifted apart. Once again, why is that important? Is because those constantly shifting continental land masses affect atmospheric circulation and oceanic circulation, the major mechanisms of heat transport. Think about what happens here, guys. We take cold air and water at the poles and we move it towards the equator. Why? So that the equator doesn't become unbearably warm. We take warm air and water from the equator and we move it towards the poles. Why? So that the poles don't become unbearably cold. That system is in equilibrium, guys. And so as the continental land masses have drifted apart, this has caused shifts in oceanic and atmospheric circulation which have affected the movement of heat across the globe. Now, we can also see, if you take a look at this picture of Pangaea, guys, we actually had a fairly large landmass covering the South Pole, okay? Just like we do today. We still have Antarctica down here. When you get those large continental landmasses over polar areas, you tend to create time periods of glaciation where you get big bodies of ice that we call glaciers, and that would have a cooling effect on overall climate. It also, plate tectonics also triggers volcanism. Remember earlier on we talked about our stratovolcanoes, guys. Remember the steeply sided cones that when they erupt, man, they're going to put on a show. Well, if you take a look at both of these pictures over here, guys, the stratovolcanoes erupting, look at all that material that these eruptions force into the atmosphere. You have ash, small particles, you have, you have solidified pieces of igneous rock, and then gases, carbon, uh, carbon oxides, nitrogen oxides, sulfur oxides. Well, here's why that's important, guys. Um, that ash, once sunlight that's coming from the sun hits that ash, it gets scattered or absorbed in the atmosphere. So usually speaking, after periods of a violent eruption, we tend to see cooler temperatures than normal because all that ash is up in the atmosphere scattering or absorbing all that sunlight. If you guys remember the, the May 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens, did you guys know that that summer, May through August, was cooler than normal? I think by about one degree. Well, because that massive stratovolcano, all that ash stayed up in the atmosphere for months afterwards, blocking sunlight, creating cooler climates or cooler temperatures. Now, here's the interesting thing, guys. At the same time that it causes temperatures to decrease, it can also have the opposite effect. Eruptions release heat into the atmosphere, and they also release greenhouse gases which are going to create that enhanced greenhouse effect that we'll talk about a little bit later. So the interesting thing with volcanoes, guys, is they can do both. They can cause cooling and warming at the same time. Kind of amazing. Our next natural cause of climate change deals with changes in Pacific currents. Okay? We talk about El Nino and La Nina. El Nino occurs, guys. What happens is, and I know we didn't talk about the trade winds, guys, but the trade winds are these winds that flow from east to west um, from 0 to 30 north, 0 to 30 south. So we have trade winds in the southern and in the northern hemisphere. Well, during El Nino, trade winds strengthen. And what happens is it pushes warm water to the west. Okay, that's, I'm sorry, that's during a normal year. So in a normal year where the trade winds are normal, you push that warm water to the west. D 
during an El Nino year, the trade winds weaken. And so instead of pushing that warm water to the west, it rebounds and comes back to the east. So during a year of El Nino, guys, you have this band of warmer than normal equatorial Pacific waters. Okay, This only happens in the Pacific Ocean, nowhere else. Well, think about what that would cause, guys. Okay, Let's say that we have this band of warmer than normal temperatures, and let's look at the Americas, both south and north. If you get this band of warmer than normal temperatures, guys, you're going to have milder winters and hotter, harsher summers in both South and North America. Okay, So years that we have El Nino, we have milder winters but harsher summers. Now, during a year of La Nina, what we have is a colder than normal um, oceanic temperatures in our equatorial Pacific Ocean. Here's what happens, guys. The trade winds strengthen. We push all of that warm water to the west. Cold nutrient waters rise from the west coast of South America and North America, and you replace that warm water with cooler, deeper waters. So, El Nino, you get a band of warmer than normal oceanic temperatures. In La Nina, you get a band of cooler than normal temperatures. Notice this blue band right here. Now, in that case, guys, if we have La Nina, what's going to happen to our winters? They're going to be colder and harsher. And what happens to our summers? They're going to be more mild in the Americas. So, winter... El Nino and La Nina are going to affect the intensity of our seasons. Now, generally, once again, if I'm in an in-person class, guys, I would ask my students, well, what do you think is more common nowadays, El or La? And the answer is El Nino, guys. We see a lot more years where we have a band of warmer than normal temperatures than colder than normal temperatures. So El Nino is a lot more common than La Nina. Our methane hydrates. Now the actual, chem the actual correct terminology, guys, is methane clathrate. I prefer the term methane hydrates. Okay? Now what a clathrate is, it's a chemical lattice that actually traps molecules within it. So I want you to think of it this way, guys. You have a lattice of solid water, of ice out here. And in the inside, you have methane molecules that are trapped. That's what a methane hydrate is. And you can actually see pictures of it down here. I know it looks like normal ice, guys, but answer me this. Can you set ice on fire? You cannot. But methane hydrate, you can because methane is flammable. You can actually see the chemical um, formula here. So you have that methane, which is CH4, trapped within that solid lattice of solid water. Now, here's how methane hydrates can affect climate, guys. We actually have significant deposits of these hydrates in both polar areas, our tundra, and in oceanic sediments. Well, here's what we're seeing today, guys. As oceans warm and as tundra areas warm, the methane hydrates melt. The, the, the outer lattice melts and it releases the gaseous methane to the atmosphere. Well, we're going to see a little bit later on, guys. Methane is another greenhouse gas. So the more methane we release to the atmosphere, the more enhanced that greenhouse effect is, the more um, radiation we're going to trap within the atmosphere, which is going to lead to even higher temperatures. So if we look at this methane hydrate, guys, this would be a positive feedback loop. So as the oceans warm because of higher temperatures, we're going to have more methane hydrates melt, which releases more methane to the atmosphere, which then causes even higher temperatures right? That would be a positive feedback loop. And so 
as the as the earth warms more methane hydrates melt releases more methane to the atmosphere which causes a stronger greenhouse effect now here are you can see where we have massive deposits of methane hydrates and uh, you don't generally find uh, you only find these these deposits in oceanic environments usually off continental land masses on our continental shelves if you remember that word and then in our polar areas you can see fairly large deposits in the Arctic Ocean in the northern hemisphere our last natural cause of climatic change are sunspots now what a sunspot is uh, is a cool dark region that develops on the sun's surface now here would be the logical argument guys well if these cool dark regions develop the sun is going to give off less radiation right that makes logically logical sense guys but actually here's what happens when we develop these cool spots on the earth's surface convection increases within the sun and these convective cells bring hotter gases to the sun's surface in areas called faculae now the warming effects of the faculae overwhelm the cooling effects of the sunspots and so what actually happens guys when these cool dark regions develop the sun gives off more solar radiation which means the earth is going to receive more solar radiation now you can actually see it down here guys what each of these peaks is is a time of sunspot activity okay this is a measurement of energy you can think or intensity over here so from 1750 to about 2000 once again you can see that these are cyclic comes about every 11 or 12 years and you'll notice that they're all not the same guys some um, times when we get sunspots we'll see a lot more solar radiation than others so it's not like we go to the same peak every time we develop sunspots it's all variable now what this is this lower line here guys is intensity or radiation you can think of energy given off by the sun this is temperature and I want you to notice something guys when you have a peak of energy given off by the sun what do you see you see higher temperatures so there is that correlation guys so every 11 to 12 years when these sunspots develop convection increases we bring hotter gases to the surface the sun gives off more solar radiation which means the earth receives more solar radiation now here is the um, sun um, this picture was taken using a filter guys notice these dark black regions here that's the sunspots that's the darker cool regions and the white spots that you see here those are the faculae those are those hotter gases coming to the sun's surface and I want you to notice something guys notice do you see more black spots or do you see more white spots the white spots dominate so the hotter gases in the faculae dominate the cooler regions of the sunspots all right let's move on now guys and let's talk about something called paleoclimatology now paleoclimatology is the study of past climates using something called proxies now here's why this is important guys we want to be able to understand past climates if we ever hope to predict future ones so this is not in itself we're not just looking back to look back guys sure we'd like to know what the climate was like a hundred thousand years ago but we want to know because we want to be able to distinguish trends in the past so that we can recognize them going forward that's why paleoclimatology is so important guys if we know what's happened in the past we can try and predict what's going to happen in the future now there's that word proxy and if you've never heard that word before guys proxy means stand-in or substitute okay 
Think about it. Let's say that we wanted to know what the climate was like a million years ago. Can we go ask the eldest person on Earth? No, of course not, guys. Okay. So what we use are various stand-ins stand in the environment to relate what past climates were like. Now, we're not going to talk about every single proxy, guys. I don't have the time. But I want to mention four of the more important ones. We're going to take a look at ice cores, tree features. We're going to talk about something called dendroclimatology. We're going to take a look at uh, pollen. And then we're going to take a look at the rock and sediment record. Now let's go back to ice cores, okay? Let's say, let's go back to the last ice age, which was from about 2.8 million years ago to about 10,000 years ago. Now think about it, during that ice age, global temperatures are a lot cooler than they are today, and these bodies of ice, these glaciers expand. Well, think about it, guys. As we create that ice, what the atmosphere was like, the composition of the atmosphere is trapped in small bubbles as the ice is created. And so what we do here, guys, is we actually, um, we go to Antarctica and we go to Greenland. I'll show you some pictures here in a second. But we take these thousands of feet of, of cores of ice. And we take needles. We poke them into these bubbles, guys. We take out the gas and we record how much CO2, how much SO2, how much NOx gas are present because that can tell us about temperature. Generally, if we have a lot of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, guys, warmer climate. Whereas if, if the CO2 and SO2 levels are lower, that means we have less greenhouse gases. That means we're going to have cooler temperatures. The other thing we can do is we can measure the oxygen isotope ratio in glacial ice. And I'm going to talk about this more in a couple minutes, guys. So if you don't understand that, give me time. We'll talk about what that's involved. The other thing is the rock and sediment record. Think about it, guys. Let's say that we're a paleontologist and we're digging in an area and we unearth a skeleton of a woolly mammoth. What does that instantly tell us about what the climate was like? It was cold. They lived during the last ice age. On the other hand, we're digging in an area and we unearth a species of plant that only lives in equatorial areas today. What does that tell us? It was warm. Okay, So plant and animal species can tell us a lot. So um, remember we talked about that um, paleontology, guys. We can use paleontology evidence, the fossil record, to tell us what the past climate was like. We can also measure those oxygen isotopes and sediments. And we'll talk about how we do that a little bit later on. But let's start with our ice core studies. These are pictures, guys, and, and there have been quite a lot of ice core studies over the last couple decades, both in Greenland, okay, the northern hemisphere, and Antarctica. Okay? Teams of scientists from across the world, guys, have gotten together and you can actually see they have what are called augers where you can actually drill into the ice and you can pull out these ice cores now the we might drill th a thousand foot ice core guys which represents let's say 200,000 years of record so the deeper we drill the longer we go back in geologic history now, here is one of these ice core studies. This is a very famous ice core taken at Vostok. Okay? This was, uh, Vostok was, uh, was on Antarctica. So this was an Antarctic ice core. Now, you can actually see the ice, guys. You see those little white spots there? Those are those bubbles where the atmospheric composition has been trapped. So once again, you pull that out, you measure certain gases. Now, from this ice core, this went back a little over 150,000 years, guys. Okay, that's, that would be 150,000 years before present. Here would be present time. And what they did from this ice core is they measured methane levels, carbon dioxide levels, and they were able to relate temperature. I want you to look at something, guys. When the CO2 levels are high, when the methane levels are high, what's the temperature like? It's warm. High, high, warm. When they're lower 
colder temperatures. So what we have done, these ice core studies have been tremendously helpful, guys, in correlating or finding a link between certain gas concentrations and what the atmospheric temperature was like. And so once again, this is just one of these famous, very famous um, ice core studies that found this link between CO2 methane levels and what the atmospheric temperature was like. Now the other thing we can do is measure these oxygen isotope ratios. Okay, So I want to go back here guys. Essentially what we're doing is we're measuring the ratio of O18 to O16. Okay. Now, remember we talked about isotopes earlier on, guys. Remember our radiometric uh, dating discussion. Remember an isotope is the same element, but with a different number of neutrons. What's the difference between O18 and O16? Two neutrons. O18 is the heavier isotope. Well, here's the interesting thing that happens, guys. And let's first talk about a period of cold climate. So, rain or precipitation that falls to the Earth's surface is generally enriched in the lighter isotope, the O16. So during a cold climate, guys, that precipitation falls to the Earth's surface and freezes. It gets incorporated in those large bodies of ice, those glaciers. So all of the O16 is tied up in ice, which means our oceans are going to be enriched in the heavier isotope, the O18. So during a period of cold climate, the O18 is going to dominate. And so if you take a look at the ratio, guys, and remember, if we have a ratio, if the number on top gets bigger, what happens to the overall number? It also gets bigger, guys. Now, Let's take a look at the opposite. Let's say that it begins to warm. As the climate warms, guys, what's going to happen to all those glaciers? It's, they're going to melt. And all of that O16 that was tied up in the ice floods into our seas, into our oceans. And so during warm climates, the lighter isotope will dominate. So the O16 will be dominant in our oceans. And so once again, if we go back to this ratio, guys, if you have a ratio and the number on bottom gets bigger, what happens to the overall number? It gets smaller. And so if we take a look at this graph, guys, on the right-hand side here, we have oxygen isotope ratios at the top, small to big, and we have uh, this is the time frame. So this would be all going all the way back to 500,000 years ago. Now notice, guys, when you have high oxygen, uh, high oxygen isotope ratios, these peaks represent cold periods of time. Where you get these much smaller oxygen isotope ratios, these represent much warmer periods of time. Now here's the great news, guys. Let's say that you measure an oxygen, oxygen isotope ratio of 2.1. What does that really tell you? Nothing. But there have been studies linking this isotope ratio to temperatures. And so here's the great news, guys. You calculate that, right, that ratio. You measure that ratio in the ice. You can go to published tables where it says, okay, if you have an oxygen isotope ratio of 2.1, this is what we think the atmosphere temperature was like. And boom, we have what we want, which is temperature. And so in these ice core studies, guys, not only can we sample greenhouse gas concentrations, but we can measure the oxygen isotope ratios, which gets us to what we want, atmospheric temperature readings. Uh, our next um, paleo, our next proxy is tree rings and pollen. And I want to talk about a branch of paleoclimatology called dendroclimatology. This is using the features of tree rings to determine past climates. 
So if you've ever cut down a tree before, guys, you'll notice these lines here in a cross-sectional view. These are called growth lines. For every year that tree is alive, it will produce one ring. Now, you'll notice something, guys. Right here, we have a period of time where the growth rings are close together. That means that the tree struggled. So maybe it didn't have enough water. Maybe uh, the temperature wasn't right. Maybe it didn't have enough nutrients. But the tree struggled for those couple of years. Well, that tells us something about climate, guys. We know the species of tree. We know what climate it likes. And during that time, it didn't have whatever. Water, nutrients, or temperature wasn't right. There are other times, guys, notice where the growth lines are far apart. That means the tree was successful, that it grew a lot during those years. So precipitation, temperature, nutrients were all within the sweet spot. Now that tells us something about climate. Here's the problem with, with these, these growth lines, the dendroclimatology, is you're really only talking about maybe a couple hundred years to a couple thousand years of record. Okay, you talk about like a common oak tree, guys. I, I, a common oak tree, I think probably the upper limit might live 150 to 200 years. So it's a very narrow, narrow limited time frame. Okay, I say about 9,000 years, guys. And really, when I talk about this, I'm only talking about sequoia trees, which are known to live for thousands of years. So. The problem with dendroclimatology is really, it, it, it'll, it's great for the last couple thousand years, but if you want to look at the climate of, ten, of let's say, 50,000 years ago, dendroclimatology is not going to be helpful. The other thing we can use is the abundance and variety of pollen within the rock record. That bottom picture, guys, is different types of pollen, what they look like under a microscope. Now here's the good news. Trees and plants have been producing pollen for hundreds of millions of years. Going all the way back, if you guys remember the Middle Paleozoic, where we had our first trees, our first flowering plants. So the good news is this extends for hundreds of millions of years. And so if we're in a particular area and we find pollen from only tropical species, that tells us about what the temperature was like. So pollen is much more useful, guys, than tree rings. The last proxy is the sediment record. Now, I don't want to get into, into too many details because this isn't a geology class, guys. But what we can look is at sediment, we can look at their composition, what minerals are present, the texture, the size and shape of those minerals, and certain structures like mud cracks or cross bedding. All of this that tells us something about the depositional environment and what it was like. So for example, guys, let's say that we, we find, we're digging in an area and we unearth mud cracks. Where do we generally find mud cracks? We find them in areas where you get very, very intense downpours that are followed by very, very dry regions. So you might find mud cracks, guys, in areas that were once were wet but then dried out over time. Well, that tells us something about um, climatic conditions. We can also measure the oxygen isotope of either lake or ocean sediments. There was an ocean study done uh, about 10 years ago, guys, that actually unearthed sediments going all the way back to about 50 million years ago. And so we had 50 million years of sediment record that we could then measure oxygen isotope ratios and get whether it was cold or warm climates. We can also use something called VARVs. I want you to take a look at this picture here, guys. Notice that you see a black layer or a dark layer and then a light layer dark light dark light those layers are called varves and they're deposited seasonally usually the dark layers are deposited during the winter months and the light are deposited during the summer months so in this case guys notice that if you look at this entire thing you'll notice that you have 
um, multiple years of record of what the depositional environment was like. And so once again, that tells us a lot about what the past climate was like as well. Now this is the end of our first part, guys. So we're going to stop here, and the second part of our climate discussion, we'll get into, I'll finally talk about what the greenhouse effect is, what global warming is, what greenhouse gases are, and then we'll take a look at some of the effects of climate change that we've seen globally.